Hello friends, my name is JJ. So Halloween in America is of course commercialized up the wazoo these days, with everyone making a ton of money selling spooky decorations and cards and snacks and mobile phone games and all the rest. And all of this stuff in turn tends to feature a fairly stable cast of Halloween characters. In fact, the cast of characters seems so stable, I decided to do a highly scientific experiment to prove it. I brainstormed a list of various cartoon franchises that feature multiple characters of their own, and then I googled for pictures of these characters dressed up as Halloween things on special Halloween merchandise. So for example, this set of Peanuts Halloween stickers, or this Looney Tunes party shirt. And after looking at a couple of different franchises, as well as a few children's books and cookies recipes and other things that popped up during my googling, I was able to come up with this highly scientific breakdown of what cartoon characters are likely to be dressed as when engaged in Halloween related marketing. The top five are Vampire, Witch, Mummy, Frankenstein, and Ghost. And then there is Wolfman in like a distant sixth place. So I would argue that these five characters represent the basic core of the American Halloween cast, the American Halloween canon, if you will. You could even say that these five characters represent a certain core canon of what Americans think about when they think about monsters more broadly. And since mythical creatures are one of the great embodiments of culture, I thought it might be interesting to take a step back and deconstruct why precisely these five beasts have become so ubiquitous in American monster culture. I mean, they're kind of random if you think about it. I mean, a witch and a ghost, fine, whatever. Witches and ghosts have basically been present in some form or another in every culture that has ever existed. But a mummy? A mummy is just some dead guy from ancient Egypt. Why did that become such a go-to American thing? And a vampire is just a human who drinks blood? Why is an American vampire always dressed like some sort of old world European aristocrat? And how did Frankenstein, a creature from early 19th century British literature, make his way in? The answer is interesting and a real monument to the degree that American pop culture and folk culture starting to become increasingly fused in the mid 20th century because as you might have guessed the reason why these three random guys have become so synonymous with monsters and thereby Halloween today all boils down to one word Hollywood so when you look at American Halloween cards or decorations from the early 20th century, you don't tend to see a lot of diversity of monsters. You got your standard sheet ghost and jack-o'-lanterns and maybe a pointy-hatted witch or a black cat here or there. These were the basic go-to symbols of Halloween when the holiday first started to become more mainstream and commercialized, which historians generally say dates back to around the 1920s or so. But then movies were invented and specifically Universal Pictures was invented. Now, the early days of cinema were not like today, where every movie is expected to be about a 50-year-old comic book character. In the 1930s, movie producers were still pulling ideas from whatever random source they could find, because since the technology was still so new, it wasn't yet super clear what kind of movies audiences would ultimately go for. There was definitely a sense, however, that movies about weird or creepy things would probably sell well. And Universal built a lot of its early fame as a studio for doubling down on this approach. In 1931, they released a film called Dracula, which was based on a famous 1897 novel by the Irish writer Abraham Stoker. I always grew up learning that Bram Stoker's Dracula was based on a real life figure from Romanian history called Vlad the Impaler, but apparently there is very little hard evidence for this, and the two figures don't even have that much in common. Stoker himself just wrote that he understood Dracula to mean devil in Romanian. In any case, Bram Stoker's novel takes place in the present day Victorian era and tells the story of a British guy who goes to visit Count Dracula, who is a mysterious rich old gentleman who lives in a castle in Eastern Europe, and spoiler alert, is actually a vampire. Now, by today's politically correct standards, we would say that this story is fairly problematic because a lot of it just takes for granted this rather condescending British stereotype of the time that Eastern Europe is this scary, weird place full of primitive, superstitious people and murderous perverts, which is of course completely 
different from how the British think of Eastern Europe today. But anyway, the book was very popular, and in 1931, Universal Pictures bought the rights and made a movie about it, starring authentic Eastern European actor Bela Lugosi as Dracula, who came complete with an authentic Eastern European accent. Listen to them. Children of the night. What music they make. Lugosi's character dressed in the way that European aristocrats in the Victorian era would dress on fancy occasions with what they call a white tie tuxedo and a medal around his neck. European aristocrats still sometimes dress this way to this day, as I explained in my award-winning video on the official dress of world leaders, capes were also a more normal thing to wear in those days than they are now. If you look at old-timey pictures of fancy men, you will often see them wearing capes to like the opera or whatever. So the Dracula film was a big hit for Universal and made Bela Lugosi into a big movie star. It was made in the days in which movies with sound were still an exciting novelty and audiences found Lugosi's performance super mesmerizing. People would quote his lines and do impressions of his accent and all of that. Universal released another big monster movie just a few months later called Frankenstein. Like Dracula, this was also based on a popular British novel, but unlike Dracula, it was much less faithful to the source material. TV Tropes says that only about 15% of what's in the original novel made it into the movie, making this one of the first documented instances in which pretentious hipsters walked out of the theater going, the book was way better. The original Frankenstein is actually quite a densely philosophical story about a guy who makes a giant terrifying man who is very strong, but also very smart. A lot of the creepiness comes from the general mysteriousness of this whole premise. Like how could someone make a man? It's never fully explained. In the movie version, however, they take this premise a lot more literally and have the Frankenstein monster be made by a mad scientist in a laboratory from pieces of corpses all stitched together and then brought to life by lightning. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! <laughs> and instead of being super smart, the creature is just this kind of lumbering oaf who can only moan, which is creepy in this whole other way. It plays with the idea that making a man would just create some sort of unholy abomination of nature. The monster was played by the English actor Boris Karloff, and the look they created for him was very distinctive, with this big ape-like brow and wide shoulders and a head that was screwed on with bolts on either side. The head was supposedly flat at the top to reflect the fact that the scientist had cut the top of the skull off to put the brain in. I was always curious why his skin was green, though. If you look it up, the standard legend is that they put Boris in green makeup because that showed up better and black and white. But of course, audiences of the time wouldn't have known that, so how did this trope get established? I think the more likely explanation is just that this is a cliché that arose gradually as a kind of riff on the way that Frankenstein was often depicted in movie posters, which often had these weird, freaky colors. Even when Frankenstein was eventually depicted in color movies, they never actually gave him green skin, so this is really more of a thing that broader American folk culture invented once the characters started being appropriated out of their original movie context, but we will get to that in a bit. The early 1940s marked the so-called second wave of horror movies for Universal, and these ones were notable for being based on original ideas rather than pre-existing novels. I should note that Universal also had a fair bit of success making movies based on other old books, including The Phantom of the Opera, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and The Invisible Man. But in the 40s, they started coming up with their own franchises, with the two biggest hits being The Wolfman and the Mummy. Egyptian mummies had become a subject of fresh fascination in the West following the discovery of King Tut's fabulous preserved tomb in 1922. Universal actually made their first mummy-related film in 1932, but it is about a mummy who becomes a normal man, and as such isn't really a normal mummy movie. A normal mummy movie wouldn't come about until The Mummy's Hand in 1940, which was the first time that audiences were introduced to the idea of a reanimated mummy as this scary thing that chases you down the hallway of the pyramid or whatever. I think The Mummy was played by Lon Chaney Jr. Is that right? 
He was another big star of the time. Now, as the years went on, the big three eventually became victims of their own success. Knowing that they had a big cash cow on their hands, Universal spent the remainder of the 1940s milking these franchises by releasing sequel after sequel and spin-off after spin-off. So Dracula was followed by Dracula's daughter and then son of Dracula. Frankenstein was followed by Bride of Frankenstein and then son of Frankenstein and then Ghost of Frankenstein. While the mummy had the mummy's tomb, the mummy's ghost and the mummy's curse. And then once the sequel well had run dry, Universal started making what were known as their Monster Rally pictures, in which multiple monsters would appear in the same movie together and have adventures. An even lower point came when they started working in Abbott and Costello, who were these two popular slapstick comedy actors of the time. Once Universal had run these franchises into the ground, a British studio called Hammer Films picked up the baton. Hammer made a deal with Universal in the late 1950s to continue their monster franchises and continue Continue, they did. Between 1957 and 1974, Hammer churned out four Mummy movies, seven Frankenstein movies, and nine Dracula movies. Oh man. So obviously by this point, these characters had pretty clearly moved from their previous era as kind of high concept literary figures of sophisticated adult cinema to these overexposed, oversaturated cornball characters associated with an increasingly cynical and money-grubbing age of Hollywood. But the other side of this was that as Americans started to revere these overdone characters less and less, they also started to satirize them a lot more, and in increasingly creative ways, too. I like this summary from the magazine Birth Movies Death. The Munsters reimagined the familiar characters as a sitcom family. Mad Monster Party was a Jack Davis Mad Magazine strip brought to stop motion life. By the 1970s, the Monsters had become both literal and metaphorical comfort food, as kids spent their Saturday mornings eating Count Chocula and Frankenberry cereal while watching either the Groovy Ghoulies, a cartoon which turned Drac, Wolfie, and Frank into a monkeys-esque pop band, or the Monster Squad, a live-action confection which treated the triumvirate as unlikely crime fighters. In other words, Americans were starting to feel more of a sense of ownership over these characters, and more of a right to use them as a source of generic monster-themed entertainment. If you look at Halloween decorations from the early 1970s, you can clearly see that it was around this time that the standard witch, ghost, and pumpkins first started to share space with Dracula, Frankenstein, mummies, and often Wolfman as well. And thus it has been ever since. Now, we live in litigious times, so you might be wondering about the legality of all of this. And this is quite interesting because while the original monster characters from the Universal movies came from very old books that had passed into the public domain by the mid-20th century, the distinctive look of these characters, as established by the movies, remained and remain to this day registered trademarks of Universal Pictures. This is less relevant when it comes to characters like the Mummy or Wolfman, who are fairly generic creatures who can only really be depicted in a generic way. But the idea of Count Dracula as a guy in a tuxedo with a cape and slick back dark hair, or Frankenstein as this big flat-headed neck bolt guy, these are very much specific interpretations of the characters that Universal people dreamed up, and thus ones that they feel they have a right to protect as their intellectual property. The news site Plagiarism Today tells me that Universal very much continues to send cease and desist orders to people who use the Universal version of Frankenstein in order to affirm their control of the character. You might have noticed that Universal also puts a great deal of effort into publicly branding the Dracula Frankenstein mummy set as the Universal Monsters as often as possible in what is clearly as much a legal flex as anything else. I mean, I don't really think that a bunch of old horror movies from the 1930s and 40s are cared about all that much these days, but Universal still makes a big show of having official Universal Monsters merch and having people dressed up as their monster characters trump ruined the Universal Studios and all that. But that said, if their goal has been intimidation, it clearly hasn't worked. American courts are generally pretty generous when it comes to granting copyright exemptions to creative works that are either satirical in nature 
or are only loosely inspired by protected characters. And since the Universal Monsters have been widely incorporated into American popular media and folk culture for at least 60 years now, I think it is getting increasingly difficult to imagine a scenario in which Universal could actually win a substantial lawsuit over some supposedly unauthorized use of these character designs. All right, so as a closing question, I would just be curious to know if you think that there are any other characters who are presently in the private pop culture space who are either transitioning or have already transitioned into the public folk culture space in the same way that Dracula and Frankenstein and the mummy have. The one that immediately comes to mind for me is Jason Voorhees from Friday the 13th. I think he's quite similar to the Universal Monsters in that he has just been so overexposed by endless cheesy sequels over the decades that I feel like he too has started to feel a bit like a sort of generic American monster. To a lot of people these days, a guy with a hockey mask and overalls is now just a kind of cliched stock character representing a crazy serial killer. I am old enough to actually remember the original Friday the 13th movies, so to me, Jason still feels like too dark of a character to completely have fun with. But on the other hand, the original Count Dracula was also an incredibly dark character, and now even Mickey Mouse dresses up as him. So let's hear your picks, and I will see you next week.